Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Uh, it is Tuesday. The infrastructure bill is still like what inching towards passage. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today because we are joined by my good friend David French from the from the Dispatch. Now, I was almost going to say National Review, but that's sort of like muscle memory. Yeah, that's so, almost two years outdated, Charlie. Can you believe that? I it has really been two years. That's it's almost that, almost yeah. Uh, well, you know. So in any case, um, I was I was just going to mention that you you've actually been on this podcast several times, uh, even since you went to the dispatch. Although I keep looking at my email box for an invitation from you guys to appear on your podcast, and that is just sort of asymmetrical. Well, we, Charlie, we, we, if you want to come talk about Supreme <laughs> Court precedent on advisory opinions, you are su- very, very welcome. That is that is an outstanding podcast. I appreciate it very much. Okay, so David, before we get into it, there's a lot I want to get into. I want to talk about uh, anti-racism. I want to talk about the big rock that they just took off uh, the campus of UW, which I wrote about yeah. in my newsletter today. I want to talk about how the anti-vaxxers are making us all insane. Uh, but you're kind of the evangelical Christian whisperer. In, in my world that you kind of every, every once in a while you will explain or translate what's going on because sometimes it does seem like a lot of people are talking or speaking in tongues and I don't understand. So um, I wanted to share this with you. This is a, a, a right wing Christian pastor who's apparently got a rather large online uh, following and uh, he has some uh, <clears throat> interesting breaking news. You know, he's, he's got, he's one of these people who, sort of you know, plays around with prophecy and he had prophesied that uh, Donald Trump would be restored to the presidency this year. And, and he's kind of moved the dates around and he's getting some blowback from people saying, hey, uh, you told us that God had told you that Donald Trump would be president again. What's with that? So um, this is this is his latest video where he's explaining um, the prophecy of the return of Donald Trump. Um, and then David um, has some news uh, that not only is Donald Trump going to be restored to the presidency, but it's actually already happened. Oh, big if big if true. <laughs> OK, let's play this. God has not forgotten. Uh, there are many that are still standing on the premise of what's happening with uh, uh, President Trump. Um, as a matter of fact, I know for a fact that he has already been inaugurated. Ah, OK, uh, big if true. And, um, I guess I can share that there was a general that was uh, March the 4th, March uh, 4th. 2021, uh, March the 4th, where he was actually sworn in as the 19th president of 19. the new reformed republic of the United States going back to 1851 <laughs> what? when everything was traded away in our nation. Really? Don't huh? want to have the time to get into that. Well, that's kind but, of uh, that's, um, that's important. You know, I, w- I do want to say this because people get so caught up with Oh, Jeff, you said by spring we'd be dancing in the streets. That's right. I did say by spring we'd be dancing in the streets. Um, I did say that President Trump uh, would be president and is president, and he is president. But uh, you need to understand something as well. We need to understand that just when the word of the Lord comes to a prophet, uh, the prophet speaks the word of the Lord. Okay. Uh, things can mm-hmm. shift. Not uh-huh. the goalpost. Yeah. People say, well, you're no. shifting the goalpost. No, I'm not shift shifting the goalpost. No, he's, he's, he's definitely not shifting the goalpost. So, David, um, <laughs> I don't know whether I want your theological insight or if you could explain this whole 19th president and what happened in 1851, because I missed this. Well, I, I got to say, I, whole, I, have to con- yeah. I have to confess ignorance here, uh, yeah, Charlie. Sorry. This is this is outside of my theological <laughs> and historical expertise. I'm I'm un. I'm unfamiliar with what was it? The new reformed Republic this established like in an 18- important thing to know about. I mean, he says, you're not going to get into it. I'm like, wait, 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 this is something that if this happened, we really should know more about it. Don't you think? Yeah. You know, Oh my this goodness. Would, this, this would have implications for Supreme court precedents and constitutional law. I think, you know, that's funny. This actually does remind me of something I wrote about uh, a few months ago. And that is how we, when you're talking about some of the evangelical, especially in charismatic circles, support for Trump, how deeply rooted it was in prophecy. And so 
you know, a lot of the arguments that people were having uh, online about, okay, wait a minute, remember the statement of moral principles in 1998 from the Southern Baptist Convention against Bill Clinton? Shouldn't that apply to Trump? And there's a lot of theological arguments and policy arguments online about Christian support for Trump. And a lot of that was just completely missing where people were and how they actually lived and what they actually believed. Because what was actually, what they were actually operating from were a series of prophecies put forward by very prominent, quote unquote, prophets in the charismatic movement. Um, (sighs) And that that was what was that was where people were operating. And so you couldn't argue against the prophecy. You couldn't argue against the notion that Trump had a special, what was called anointing on his life. And so therefore, Mm. you know, a lot of these quote unquote prophets are now not just, you know, under fire, they're trying to twist and turn and show that maybe sort of kind of, they got it right anyway. It's a very, it's a whole Um, a part of the American culture that, you know, if you're just following blue checks on Twitter, you wouldn't know anything about it all. It it also is a reminder that some of these prophecies are unfalsifiable, right? Because it's like you're you're waiting for the hail bot comet to come and, you know, saying it's going to come on Sunday and it's going to do X, Y, and Z, and then it doesn't come on Sunday. You know, we might expect that people would go, okay, you were completely wrong about this. I'm going to go find another prophet. Um, but they always, there's always an explanation, right? It's, it's once you're invested in these things, it's very hard to shake people away from all of this, isn't it? Oh, you it's, ve- you can't just give them big. a series of facts and reason them out of it. You've written. About yeah, this, it's yeah. very hard. And one of the most discouraging things about the entire prophecy world immediately post-election was that when some people who had the integrity to say, I missed it. I let my desires get ahead of my, you know, perception of what the Spirit of God was saying. They were threatened. They were overwhelmed with attack, not threatened because they had gotten the prophecy wrong, but threatened for saying that Trump had lost the election. And so a lot of these guys who tried to, and and there were a couple of in particular who stepped forward to say, hey, uh, I, we got this wrong. I got this wrong. I'm sorry were deluged with um, angry, furious, sometimes threatening responses saying, no, you did not get it wrong. Donald Trump did, in fact, win the presidency. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's the kind of thing where all across every different kind of subculture within the GOP that, you know, touches on Trump has been infected by this, not only are we for Trump, but we're going to you know, dogpile on anybody who breaks ranks at all up to and including threats, even into the prophecy world. I, I got nothing for you on this. I, I really do. I mean, this is, I mean, we know the, the, the words that are going through my head are, you know, we are so screwed. I mean, it's just listening to this. Uh, but it is, it, it is a reminder that we don't understand a lot of what's going on out there, and um, and I'm, I'm not sure what we could do about it if, if we if we would. So the reason that I uh, I asked you to come on the podcast today, David, was uh, to answer the question: Whatever happened to David French? <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, I I, I, I I've, I've said this to you before, but I am genuinely <laughs> okay. Just between you and me, I am just genuinely just you know blown away by this obsession that there are that some people on the sort of the MAGA right have with you. And it just, I mean, they, in the last month, you had this screed by Michael Anton about David French and how terrible you are. I think the Federalist did that. Who wrote the article, Whatever Happened to David French? Uh, I don't know who, I, I write her on a religious a, website, yeah. Pathios. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, you know, and, and I think your point is, hey, you know, it's not me. I'm still here. Whatever happened to you people, right? I mean, and a lot of this has to do with, with the, with the arguments over, over race um, right. and, 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 and racism. Uh, so let's just talk about this because you've written some things that have been, um, that have triggered uh, some of the MAGA folks oh, uh, gosh, ab- ab- yeah. about the fact that, you know, OK, so um, the performative wokeness of the CRT crowd can be uh, uh, illiberal and obnoxious. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to have a serious reckoning with the legacy of race. And this is this is the, one of the loneliest places in American politics right now to say, OK, you know, you folks on the left are crazy with the CRT stuff, the critical race theory. But on the other hand conservatives actually do need 
to uh, you know to acknowledge that we have to do something about this history because that's there's sort of no tribe for that position, is there, David? Yeah, I mean, you know, right now, and I've I've honestly never seen anything quite like what I'm seeing in especially in the midsummer on the anti woke um, hysteria that swept through a lot of the right wing uh, and the anti CRT hysteria. And when I say anti CRT, I think that's not exactly accurate because it was so much more than anti CRT. Mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. was essentially take anything one inch that was perceived to be one inch to the left of the hard right on a race issue, label it CRT and condemn it as vigorously as you would condemn like the, the wildest theory you'd heard in the ethnic studies department at Oberlin, you know? And, and so what ended up happening was there was no longer any ground at all in, uh, at least in the, in these far right circles between the right and the far left, if you were, if you moved one inch, one inch away from what the far right was demanding, then you're for CRT, then they're going to say you're for all of these crazy diversity PowerPoints you see pop up online, or, you know, anything that Kendi says, or anything that Robin D'Angelo says, that's you, that's your tribe. And, and it was really, it, it was and is one of the more bizarre in hysterical things I've seen in public life. Let me tell you how radical I am, Charlie. I'm where the Southern Baptist Convention was in 2019. Mm. Okay. Mm. In, in 2019. Notorious so, radicals. Yeah. Notorious yeah. right-wing radicals. Um, Nothing's more woke than woke Baptists. <laughs> it's, in, the, in 2019, the Southern Baptist Convention passed a resolution called Resolution 9, and it was about critical race theory and intersectionality. And it had, it was kind of, it was moderately long, but it basically said this, and this is basically where I am on the issue of CRT and intersectionality, and that is that scholars in these were in these realms of critical race theory and intersectionality have brought forward some insights about American life that are valuable, about American history, about American culture, that are valuable. However, CRT as a totalizing ideology or worldview or intersectionality within CRT, any of these things as totalizing worldviews and totalizing um, uh, explanations for American life and experience and history are woefully deficient. And they're especially deficient as totalizing worldviews as compared to Christianity. And so it's a classic, um, what is it? Uh, eat the meat, spit out the bones kind of approach yeah. to an idea, which is kind of the way I was trained to look at ideas in general, not as threats, but as something to understand, to analyze, to take what from it that is good. If there is something good to reject the bad, if there is something bad and making that statement is now considered to be radically woke that you're for embedding CRT and in American institutions and Charlie, I've been exposed to th- CRT for 30 years. Um, I've litigated against some of the worst effects of CRT. The mm-hmm. university speech code is inspired in some places by critical race theory back in the late 1980s, early 1990s when that movement began. And I've you know struck down multiple speech codes around the country. I know what this is. I know its uses. I feel like I know its limitations. But again, this is where the Southern Baptist Convention was in 2000, in 2019. And now if you articulate that view, that's how quickly the right moved on this, sh- this issue towards r- r- true radicalism. Every bit as radical as some of the weirdest diversity slides you've ever seen, except on the other side in, in, in a really remarkably short amount of time. So I'm interested in talking to you about your, um, your, your thesis about our responsibility. Uh, you know, I, I think the, you know, much of the pushback that you see on the right is from conser- white conservatives who say, look, I, you know, don't blame me for things that happened 100 years ago. I did not own slaves. I did not support slavery. I did not fight for the Confederacy. Why should I be blamed for this legacy of, of slavery or Jim Crow when I did not contribute to it 
and um, and you're you're demanding sort of a racial collective guilt or visiting the sins of the father upon the sons. And I think you have a nuanced reaction to that because, I mean, you understand, I mean, obviously yeah. we, appreci we appreciate the people saying, you know, um, I should be judged um, on my own character, on my own life, not on the color of my skin. And I certainly should not be blamed for things that I had nothing to do with. And yet there is a collective responsibility. There is an historic legacy. And, and you've tried to, I, I think, you know, in, you know, sort of break that out. And, and this is one of the reasons why you're being attacked and for, for listeners. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the latest uh, sort of spasm of anti-David French uh, writing has to do with your basically raising your hand and saying, okay, um, we actually do need to deal with this historic legacy. Could, so you, could you could walk me through your position on this? Yeah. So look, I'm completely of the mind. So just, you know, I'm from, I'm, I'm from the South. My family's from the South. My ancestors fought for the Confederacy. I do not have individual guilt for what they did in 1860 from 1861 to 1865 and before or after. Um, I, I'm not responsible for what they did. I'm not guilty of that. Mm -hmm. The sin that they committed is the way to put it. I, as David French, I'm not guilty of the sin my great, great, great grandfather committed. Yeah, absolutely. And if somebody is sending, you know, showing 10 year olds slides that says that there's something wrong with their quote unquote whiteness because of history, that there's something wrong with their, this 10 year olds whiteness. Well, that's a problem. That's, you know, if you're trying to tell someone you are individually guilty of the sins your ancestors committed, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. However, um, institutions, so many of the same institutions that existed in 1861 and before and during the Reconstruction era and post-Reconstruction Jim Crow, all of these institutions or many of them still exist, like, uh, say, a city, let's just say, like, say, a city of Birmingham or a church, like, let's go back to the Southern Baptist Convention. Maybe even if you're talking about uh, a church, my church that I attended was founded in 1807, the church that I attended for many years in Columbia, Tennessee. And these institutions were actors throughout American history. And when we belong to these institutions, in many ways, we inherit the responsibility of the institutions to deal with the injustice that these institutions created. Okay. So for example, here's a super popular one to talk about. And that is uh, redlining, mm -hmm. redlining and residential segregation. That's often a shorthand for residential segregation more broadly. So for centuries and then up to up through, um, you know, 18, I mean, 1964, not only was residential segregation common, it was often enforced and, you know, at gunpoint, it was you could only live if you were black in certain areas. You could not live outside of those areas. And so residential seg segregation enforced by law. And then you remove in 1964 with the Civil Rights Acts and, and you make it illegal to force people to live in a certain space. But that doesn't ameliorate or rectify the existing, the harm that has been inflicted on this community. And one thing that I talked about was, for example, the wealth gap. Um, African-Americans in this country have about one-tenth the household wealth, one-tenth the household wealth of the median white family. So what does that mean? That's less money for down payments. That's less money for security deposits. That's less ability to have social mobility. And so if I am part of an institution, whether it's a city, whether it's a church, whether it's a nation that implemented this system that for a very long time subjected these individuals to really grotesque uh, racial discrimination that there is then a responsibility that I have as a member of the institution that did this to try to rectify and ameliorate the harm. That's so, not the same thing as saying you, Charlie, you, David, are guilty of what your ancestors did, but you are saying you, Charlie, you, David, you belong to institutions that have committed um, injustices and the effects of those injustices still exist. And shouldn't we try to do something about that? In what way? How rectify it? Um, are you talking about um, 
you know, I, I mean, what what you know is affirmative action, um, racial quotas? Uh, what what well, exactly? So, yeah, that's a really good question. So I do not think that you rectify discrimination with more discrimination. So, for example, I think equal protection under the law is an, an imperative. I mean, one of the things that got us in the problem is the denial of equal protection in those circumstances now where we continue to deny equal protection. Often the effects are really toxic, very divisive, and quite um, unjust. So, for example, let's take the Harvard admissions litigation. Um, right now, it, the Harvard admissions uh, practices for many years essentially capped the number of Asian students. So mm -hmm. that what you were ending up doing was trying to hit, cr essentially cr diversify and to some extent correct the historical wrongs committed by Harvard um, by victimizing 18 year old Asian Americans? Uh, no. That, and I, perversely enough, the Harvard admissions policy actually benefits wealthy white applicants um, by penalizing and capping the number of Asian Americans. So I think violations of equal protection are um, very divisive, uh, unconstitutional, and compound and try to correct one injustice by committing another injustice, which I think is a real problem. So, so what, is it? Yeah. So, but but is this? Are, are you say, saying that equality under the law means then that that despite all of the systemic um, racism, all of these inequalities, that now we need to have colorblind uh, legal system that you cannot take into account the years of of deprivation. So, I mean, no, this, so, this, is, this is where the tension is, because I agree with you. I don't think that, in, you know, that, that I don't think you correct injustice with more injustice. On the other hand, to be colorblind is basically to say, OK, um, even though the system has been rigged up until now, let's be fair now. Well, not well, you know, not yeah. that's not exactly right. So, okay. for example, let's take um, educational. Let's look at residential segregation and educational yeah. segregation, which are deeply intertwined. So you can say, okay, wait a minute. We now, we recognize there's a problem with residential segregation and educational um, achievement gaps. So what we can do is we can very intentionally put resources where resources have been absent. That's one. Number two, we can very intentionally create edu uh, educational choice where educational choice has been absent. You know, that's another. Number three, we can say, what are all of the existing structures that prevent residential mobility into better school systems, into better neighborhoods? And when you lift up that rock, Charlie, holy smokes, there are all kinds of systems in place right now that prevent social mobility. So, uh, for example, zoning rules and regulations that limit multifamily housing, for example, which a lot of people support them for non-racist reasons, traffic congestion, overcrowding of schools, et cetera, et cetera. But there are a lot of things now that essentially rules of, of uh, zoning regulations and other kinds of re regulations that create, in essence, huge gated communities with no gates. But it's there is effectively walling people out of them as if you had a, wa a wall and a moat by all the zoning. So what are you going to do to... Uh, increase the ability of people to literally pick up and move to a better neighborhood. You know, all of these things are race blind, but you're motivated in targeting the neighborhood because of the injustice that's been inflicted on the neighborhood. Then another thing, for example, there are race neutral policies that have race disproportionate impacts. So I'll give you a good example. Child allowances like the mm -hmm. Romney plan, mm -hmm. which I really liked. The Biden plan, which I consider a, if the Romney plan's an A plus, the Biden child allowances is like a B, B plus. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something that is going to reduce a lot of folks who've looked at this as this is going to reduce child poverty considerably. Well, because of many of the historical injustices in the United States, child poverty is not equally distributed across American demographics, the American demographic spectrum. So that's something that is a race neutral policy that has a race disproportionate positive effect. Another one, for example, is the elimination of qualified immunity. This is that yep. doctrine that often allows, mm -hmm. it's what uh, Judge Willett of the Fifth Circuit calls uh, unqualified impunity, that uh, hmm. 
often allows agents of the state to violate your civil rights without paying compensation to their victims. Uh, again, removing qualified Im immunity is a race ne neutral policy that because civil rights violations are not equally distributed across the American demographic spectrum would have race positive race disproportionate effects. And so, you know, literally you can just keep doing this all day long on example after example of the ways in which you can dismantle institutions that inhibit social mobility without violating equal protection. You know, this is uh, I, every one of those ideas I think is, 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 is sound. And I think that they are substantive. And going back to the beginning of our conversation, though, it is interesting um, how this debate about race has been hijacked, not uh, has, has been deflected, distracted away from these substantive uh, proposals, policy issues to the the, the signaling, um, you know, the, yeah. uh, you know, CRT is evil or um, the, the wokeness vir virtue sig signaling. And look, when I say it happens on both sides, don't inundate me with people saying both sides is more. There's a moral equivalency here. I. I I think this is part of the problem that that, I, that we've we've been willing to. It's sort of like how bad money drives out good money. Sort of the fake symbolism drives out the the real um, the issues that might actually advance social justice. Um, and, and this this is where the big rock comes in. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> this, this, I read about this in my newsletter, Morning Shots, which is free. You can you, you can look it up. It, it seems to I, I'm going to get a lot of blowback. Like, why are you spending time on this? And, I think it's important to show how, in fact, e these 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 kind of symbolic things just take away from a real discussion of real change. So it's a story of the University of Wisconsin Madison, very very liberal campus, where and this is not a parody. This is I'm not making this up. They spent fifty thousand dollars last Friday removing a seventy ton boulder from campus. This is a two billion year old Precambrian era glacial specimen. It's been there forever, obviously, right? It's, right? So it's two billion. They removed the rock because activists said that it was a symbol of racism, a symbol of anti-blackness. The rock. It's a rock. And the entire basis of this is one reference in 1925 in a newspaper story where somebody referred to this rock by um, the N-word, said that it was, you know, N-word head or something. The historians, the researchers have have combed through all of the archives, all of the files. Literally, there's no other reference to this rock in that using that word ever since that one thing in 1925. University historians have not been able to find any other person who ever used the slur. And yet uh, the Black Student Union demanded last year that this rock be removed and the university went along with it. And it's kind of breathtaking when you read it. You know, they're, they're now patting themselves on the back that now students are protected from casually coming upon the rock and being traumatized by it. It's a freaking rock. Yeah. And, and with, with, with no racial connotations whatsoever. And one of the arguments that they're using is that commonly, according to Wikipedia, um, let me see if I can actually find this. According to uh, Wikipedia, that during the 1920s, it was this derogatory term was used to describe any large, dark rock, just in any rock. Now, yeah. see, here's, here's where you get, David. Now, now, are all rocks supposed to be tainted with this history of racism? Are we supposed to remove any rock that might be out there that someone might have a racist thought about? And my whole point about this, this is inane, this is preposterous, this is silly, this is performative wokeness. It accomplishes nothing except to make you look ridiculous. Yeah, you know, this is what happens in the race debate all the time, and it gets so frustrating. You will very quickly move from substance. I remember there was a short period, a very short period of time in the right after George George Floyd was murdered, yeah. where there was this flare of interest in mm -hmm. concrete policy changes, right? Um, it just it was like a, a meteor flashing through the sky and lighting up the countryside, and then just like that, it's gone. Instead, uh, instead, it was like which statue needs to be torn down now, or right, and and then it turns into you know when the the backlash is. Well, which diversity PowerPoint slide deck is outrageous today? 
And so things get diverted into symbolism and often into just abject stupidity. Um, and there's a, there's a very human reason why that is the case. And the very human reason why is, look, Charlie, it is a heck of a lot easier to move a rock than it is to change the achievement gap yep. in American schools. So mm -hmm. you can feel like if you want to do something about race, you can move a rock. Or here's the thing that happens with a lot of these really wild diversity trainings you see on in corporate America. You know, it's one thing, it's a lot easier to um, change your diversity PowerPoint deck than it is to actually invest in your community and mentor young, um, young people, young men and women uh, to, to put them in a position to succeed in your company. But you can put that diversity PowerPoint slide out there and you can make it more and more radical to show that you're hearing everybody. But you know what? There's all kinds of studies that show that diversity training basically does nothing. And to the extent it does what people want it to do, it also frequently generates a backlash. So again and again, what ends up happening is you have this really hard thing, this very hard thing that nobody has perfect answers to, which is how do you ameliorate the effects of 345 years from 1619 to 1964 of violently uh, of, of racial discrimination and bigotry defended by violence. How do you rectify the effects of those 345 years in the 57 contentious years since the, mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Act was passed? That is hard. That is difficult. That is something you have to approach with humility and recognize that some things we've tried maybe haven't worked and have been counterproductive. Some things that we've tried have worked. And instead of having that conversation, which is a hard conversation, which requires us to approach this issue in goodwill, in good faith, instead we can say, well, let's move a rock. Let's move a rock. <laughs> See, I actually have a theory about this because I've really been thinking about it because this is dumb even by the standards of, of, of you know, the Madison campus. Uh, and I, I've, I've met the chancellor of UW-Madison, uh, Rebecca Blank, and she's a serious person. And I'm trying to think through, I mean, I really, I spend some time just thinking through like, what was she thinking? Why would you go along with this? Do you know how silly this would do? And I actually have kind of a theory. I think that she calculated that it was probably better to appease these activists by giving them the rock as opposed to that if you didn't give them the rock, they would continue to focus on removing Abraham Lincoln from Bascom mm. Hill. Abraham Lincoln, there's a statue up there um, that, you know, presides over Bascom Hill on the Madison campus. And yeah, there have been demands uh, for, you know, Abe's uh, defenestration as well. Uh, and maybe she's figuring, I'm willing to trade off this rock for yeah. Lincoln because the Lincoln thing would be a really big deal. This makes me look si silly. Um, that actually might cost me much. I, d I don't. I don't know. Hey, uh, let's let's take a quick break and then I'm going to come back. I want to talk about how the anti vaxxers are um, making us uh, all crazy and uh, the good news that you're finally catching up with me on television. So we'll be back with David French <laughs> in a moment. Hey, Charlie Sykes here. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you sign up for Bulwark Plus, you will have access to our morning newsletters to JVL's Triad, uh, as well as our whole suite of podcasts. This one will remain free, but if you want to listen to The Secret Podcast or uh, participate in our live streams uh, or others like The Next Level Podcast, uh, please consider joining Bulwark Plus. Hey, we're back with uh, David French. Okay, so the good news, David, is apparently you've caught up with me and the Queen. Uh, the Queen of England, in our television watching habits. Do you know that the Queen of England also watches Line of Duty? I did not know that. Okay, see now this is going to change the way you watch the show, isn't it? That's fantastic. It is. It's now, such a good show. It is. A, you just finished uh, season three, right? Uh, when we just finished season four, we oh, did that wow. one. In, we did that one in in two days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are. OK, well, there's more and you got, you got to stick with it. It's great. But see, now, as you watch, you go, OK, wait, look, can I just pause this? Because the queen watched that scene because that was intense. This is not this is not one of your British cop shows where they sit around and eat cucumber sandwiches. Right. I mean, this is no. there's there's stuff. And so when I found out that this is what the and the queen likes to sit around and talk with court officials, including the vice admiral who runs Buckingham Palace about uh, about the motivations of the characters and discussing the plot lines. 
which are complicated. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There is a deep layer of corruption in that unnamed hmm. British city, Charlie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, yeah, so for people who are looking for uh, people, you know, I, I often will ask us for our, our recommendations. Um, I, I had gone through uh, Broadchurch, Shetland, Hinterland. There's a great series called Vera, by the way. Um, but uh, this the line of duty definitely strongly recommend. I'm glad. And you, of course, you're also waiting for uh, the Last Kingdom, the Last season. Kingdom, and the yeah. next next season of Peaky Blinders. Um, there's so much good television to wait to waiting, and then the, the last season of The Expanse. All of this is stuff is coming. Um, it's I'm waiting for Ozark. I'm holding oh, out for yeah. Ozark. And Secession, so, Ozark, Secession. I mean, Succession. I'm sorry. Well, then I've been saving that one. Um, so, in one of the articles about whatever happened to David French or David French is pure evil or whatever it was, I think it was I think it was Michael it was was one of these that said the 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 moment that you realized that that David there was something terribly terribly bent about you was the fact that you admitted that you like Game of Thrones. Oh which, yeah, yeah. I there's an obsession about that if you like certain kinds of television. This is we're living in a very very strange age. And I, w I was tempted to, you know, push back and say, you know, you, you know, it's, I mean, imagine an earlier age saying, and yes, he's been known to watch King Lear as well. And there's violence and suicide and King, well, I'm not going to compare this to Shakespeare. I know that's silly, but, you know, to, to, to suggest that somehow there's, I mean, are, are we, are we, are we wrong to say that there's no moral content? I mean, there's, there's no moral commentary about ourselves because we happen to like this kind of entertainment? You know, what it is, is that people, that what's happening is there was, it, there was an immense amount, immense amount of consequential moral compromise that went into the Christian support for Donald Trump. Yes. Just an immense amount. And that, that compromise in being poured into supporting Donald Trump had really catastrophic consequences in our nation and our culture. Um, the mishandling of the pandemic alone, the way, the extent to which he mishandled the pandemic alone would put him in the bottom five presidents in the history of the United States of America because sheer incompetence in face of an of a overwhelming public crisis is, you know, I'm sorry, you're, you, if you get, a, if you face a serious challenge as president and no one is saying that responding to COVID was easy. No one is arguing that. But, you know, when you sign up and you put your hand in the air and you take the oath of office, you're saying whatever challenges come, I'm going to deliver my best efforts for the American people. And his efforts were abysmal. And that's just COVID. He left America more divided. He left America sick. He left America worse off economically. And again, you can say, yeah, that's the pandemic, David. That's the pandemic, David. But handling the pandemic better would have had a real effect on our economy as well. I mean, there is so much to say about his failure, never mind the fact that he also tried to overthrow our democracy. <laughs> that, that's also in there in that record. And so what ends up happening is that people then look at Christian critics of Trump and they try to find some area where maybe they don't have the moral high ground, where they... Um, where they are, uh, um, any flaw, any flaw, there's a flaw and well, you can't say anything about Donald Trump's affair with porn stars, Mr. French and his hush money to cover them up or his more than a dozen corroborated allegations of sexual harassment and predation against him because you watch the HBO equivalent of an R-rated movie. Yes. I mean, that, that's literally the level of discourse we're dealing that, with. That is the level of discourse, is that, yes, you have no ground because you have watched movies in which there is nudity. There are naked ladies. And therefore, you know, you need to sit this one out. Yes, you, need to, you need to sit this one out. We have revoked your pundit card on all of these issues because, okay, so you, you raised the, the whole uh, coronavirus thing. Um, and by the way, I also love Game of Thrones and I make no apologies for it whatsoever. Um, the anti-vaxxers are, uh, you, you know, we, we, we mentioned this early on, are, are making us crazy. It, you know, what we're seeing is that vaccine hesitancy, I think, is morphing into a just, you know, vaccine denialism. But so 
did you, did you have somebody in mind who's driving you the most crazy? The, the, the people who are the worst, I think, are the opinion leaders and also the governors who are aggressively standing um, ag ag against uh, vaccine requirements. I mean, they're not only not helping um, or not showing leadership, they are actively playing a malign role. Yeah, you know, I would say, so what you, what you have is a very large segment of Americans who are growing, in, not just, they're not just vaccine hesitant anymore. They're vaccine refute, they're, they're flat out refusing, and they're often growing more stubborn in that refusal. And what ends up happening is whenever there is a market, that market, wherever, when, wherever a market for, exists for sort of opinion or for politicians to reinforce people's existing choices, you're going to find that market's going to be filled. And so you've got everything from Marjorie Taylor Greene doing what she does to, you know, the roar of the crowd in Alabama. She goes to Alabama and talks about how Alabama is the least vaccinated state and people cheer Yeah. Um, yeah. to stuff that you'll find in the Federalist, like, um, an article yesterday, vaccine right, and so mask coercion is a purge of Republican voters and Republicans are letting it happen. And so, you know, and this is where it's talking about, you know, if you actually read the article, it talks about, it doesn't talk about vaccines as vaccines. It calls them COVID-19 therapy shots. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, just an unbelievably drafted article that plays into every ounce of paranoia that exists about vaccines. And these, this is from people who know better. Um, these are people who know better. And so what you're doing is you've got this feedback loop that's being created that's now filtering into the a populist anti-establishment GOP um, world. And so that so now, you know, being anti-vax is sort of a sign of you being anti-establishment within the GOP. It's just it's become a litmus. So toxic. So, I mean, the, the the way the governors are responding, I think it's very interesting that uh, you have Asa Hutchinson in Arkansas who's admitting that he made a mistake by signing legislation banning masks, and he's saying, "Hey, I want to undo that." Which you know is that like, good for you uh, to acknowledge that circumstances change, your opinion changes. The contrast, uh, Ron DeSantis down in Florida, uh, even as the hospitalizations are just going through the roof, is pushing, uh, you know, is doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on this, uh, even though he lost that lawsuit against uh, the, the the cruise lines, which said, hey, you know, we should be allowed to require vaccinations. Uh, he's he's going to appeal that. He's still pushing these bans. He's threatening to defund some of the schools uh, if they have max requirement, mask requirements. It, it, you know, DeSantis at this point is, he's locked into that feedback loop though, isn't he? And and, well, you know, and and Greg Abbott, they're locked into the loop. They can't now be seen to be soft on vaccines or hard on vaccines, whatever. Well, you know, what's interesting about DeSantis, so he has very vocally advocated vaccines. He's gotten his vaccine, you know, on TV. He has given impassioned arguments for vaccines, but then he also is always covering that right flank. And he's sort of giving, he's, he's sort of building this cottage industry of proposing or passing or, um, uh, unconstitutional legislation <laughs> and to only to have it sort of promptly struck down like his social media censorship bill. Like he just had his effort to interfere with the cruise industry struck down. And so these things are happening to where, what you end up happening with DeSantis. And I, and I think that here's where I think the media from the beginning of the, uh, of the epidemic has really made him, it has really, it really honed in on DeSantis as a villain and when it, it picked the wrong villain early, the the villain, Andrew Cuomo, uh, yeah. was a guy who his record in hindsight looks horrifically bad, whereas DeSantis sort of by the numbers, and we'll see how all this shakes out after Delta variant sweeps through, has done empirically a better job than New York with an older population than New York. But at the same time, he does do these things. Where the only, you know, the there isn't a reasonable explanation for them other than sort of, you know, bowing to the culture war demands of the hard, hard right. And, you know, part of me even wonders, Charlie, does he do this stuff knowing the courts are going to sweep it away? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and and does he do this stuff knowing it won't, you know, that that the, the legal impact of it will be minimal? You know, I don't know. But um, 
Oh, I you know, have no, he, I have no doubt. He just knows that whatever he does, as long as he claims that he fights, that he does it, that he tried, that's going to be good enough. You know, because the one thing is, if he, if he wanted, if he, he could go into the public square and say, "Look, I have always advocated vaccines. I respect the rights of private businesses to Im- impose their own rules regarding their employees. I ex- respect the local control of local schools," and he would have one of the better records to run on compared to many other governors based on the lower death rates in the state of Florida compared to other big states, the better economy in the state of Florida compared to other big states. He would have a different record, but he's going and he's fighting that culture war. And then he sort of claims victim status when he fights that culture war by saying, well, you're paying too much attention to me because my record in these other areas is good. And look, uh, you know, look, the, the the reality is these intrusive state efforts to try to limit the ability of private enterprise and local authorities to protect public health, that's regardless of the rest of your record, that is onerous. That is coercive in the worst way in a pandemic. And so, yeah, it, that whole Florida debate is frustrating on all sides. It it, it is, and I, I I guess I'm I'm more critical probably um, than than you are of DeSantis. I mean, I I think he's just thugging this thing out, and and the way that he uh, at, at the time when it's you know there's this massive spike in hospitalizations in Florida, the fact that he's decided he's going to demagogue uh, the border and the immigration issue, you know, uh, you know, to score political points against Biden, and he's raising money off of it. Uh, that just strike, you know, suggests to me that he, he is not a good faith actor. Um, that he is just saying these things. That he's playing to the base, regardless of what the the reality on the ground is. And so, a lot of what he's doing is is very theatrical. I think it's also interesting. There's this. I, I'm I'm, guess, I'm getting the sense that the anti anti Trump uh, conservative media is quickly shifting to anti anti DeSantis that, <laughs> well, that they're, they're, they're going to anytime you tweet anything about DeSantis, you get the usual suspects who oh how dare you say that? And of course, there's the Andrew Cuomo thing. I mean, Andrew Cuomo's a thug as well. I mean, he's an easy yeah. one at this point. He's, he's easy yeah. for us. Um, but it is, think, inter- you know, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think on DeSantis, what I my my issue with the DeSantis discourse so yeah. we now have a whole DeSantis yeah. discourse, is what are you criticizing him for? Mm-hmm. And because originally a lot of people were way over the top on the overall Florida reaction to coronavirus, which actually, you know, as the pandemic has played out, has proven to be more effective than many states. But if you're going to criticize him for this, um, you know, culture war cosplay that he does, have at it. That is, you know, that's that's contributing to this problem in a pretty in a in a pretty decisive way. So, you know, I think a lot of it is that a lot of people built up a ton of resentment over the course of the pandemic that Florida was being singled out as a particularly grievous offender uh, against public health when other states did much worse. Um, and so then they're now reflectively defending DeSantis almost, you know, it's, it's, you got to rally, you know, you got to protect him. You got to defend him when he's doing a lot of stuff right now. That's definitely this culture war cosplay that is happening all over the hard right. And well, I mean, all and, of and, that and, is definitely destructive. Well, and he's also feeding into that sort of authoritarian impulse. Um, this, this transition that we've seen and you've been living with for the last year, you know, watching the sort of, you know, uh, the, the new illiberalism on the right, where what you really want is someone who will use the levers of government yep. power to punish uh, people you don't like. So, for example, the unconstitutional media law that he pushes through, which yep. is completely authoritarian and it is completely, you know, post-liberal um, and, uh, you know, telling the, the cruise ship liners what they can't do, bullying local officials. You know, they move from Yes, we're all about local control to no, I am going to dictate what you do. And also, I think that he's played a role in this tribalization of the entire coronavirus. Um, I think that he's fed into that, you know, that you can be an anti-establishment hero by pushing back against uh, the quote unquote medical establishment. So I think when we look back on this and ask, you know, how did this become so tribalized and politicized? It's hard to not tell it's, it's, it's hard not to have him be a prominent part of that story. 
And I think that he's going to have to carry a big load of that. And now, especially as things are looking awfully bad in Florida, his refusal to adjust like Asa Hutchinson is, and the fact that he's become increasingly authoritarian and increasingly uh, demagogic about it, I think tells you a lot about who Ron DeSantis is. Well, you know, there's going to be, you know, we're not, what's so heartbreaking is we should be, we should be really moving out of this pandemic right now. And we're not. I mean, I'm looking at the yeah. world of meters um, cases from yesterday, 102,000 new cases yesterday, so 326 Americans died yesterday. Um, the the number of 120 Floridians died yesterday. This is something that is not over. And so the full story of the coronavirus reaction and who in the in this long, grueling, deadly season of American life, who did well and who did poorly, that book is still being written. And so I agree with you, Charlie, that the the part that he is playing now with aggressiveness, ag- ag- aggressive posturing against even private enterprise engaging in prudent measures to protect right. the health of their employees and their customers. I, you know, th- this to me... This to me of, of GOP officials, Republican officials taking aim at private enterprise Stunning. that wants to engage in to protect the health, that wants to protect the health of its employees. And look, vaccines, they're working. I mean, these things save lives at scale. And then to take aim at private enterprise that wants to protect their own employees, protect their customers is frankly stunning to me that this is happening. Again, this is not, we're not talking about state mandates here. We're talking about the state saying to private businesses that you cannot impose a, and, and, and on cruise ships, Charlie, I mean, <laughs> really, that's what, 2000 people in a giant Petri dish. <laughs> it's, it's just absolutely unbelievable to me that this is what the GOP has come to. I mean, and, and don't get me started on the church's role in this. I mean, if you had told me if you had told me six years ago that in in six years that that white evangelicals would be among the most vaccine hesitant members of a community in a in the midst of yeah. a pandemic that yeah. has killed more than six hundred thousand people, I would have thought you were being an anti Christian bigot. Yeah, I would have. No, I, I know exactly what you mean, and and, and I, I I can imagine myself pushing back on that as well. Um, that this is part of you know some sort of elitist uh, you know secular. Uh, you know, secular, um, you know, contempt for people of of faith. Okay, so one last thing I would just wanted to to, to just to, to mention since I'm I'm talking with you, you know, every once in a while people will ask me, and I'm sure you get the same thing. Why do you pay attention to X, Y, or Z? Why do you give them a platform? They they don't they don't matter. I think one of the lessons we've learned over the last uh, decade is that we have to pay attention to some of the things that may look like that they're on the margins. So, for example, I was thinking back to the uh, Sora Bamari versus David French debates about um, illiberalism. Mm-hmm. And, and very easy for people to have said, well, that's a personality thing. These are you know, two writers. Uh, you know, it's obviously not that significant. But clearly, and I was thinking about that this week, to watch how that has morphed, and Sora Bamari being one of these, you know, uh, in, you pronounce it integralists? Integralists, I believe. In, in, integralists. Um, very, you know, post, uh, post liberal, uh, has a fascination with, uh, with authoritarianism to watch how that has morphed on the right into Tucker Carlson being in Hungary, um, which is going to morph into God knows what, I mean, the Overton window is moving on the right much faster. And so this is why we have to pay attention because that debate that you had with Sora Bamari about, do we believe in liberal constitutional democratic values or not is actually now i think you know moving into the center of this 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 really fight for the soul of the conservative movement i mean i i, I mean I, am i wrong to draw a line from the sorab uh, the the sorab uh, david french uh, arguments uh, being the debate uh, to what's going on now with uh, with tucker carlson on fox news in front of an audience of tens of millions of people yeah, I, I mean, I think that the the debate I had with Sorab was part of a continuing a, a, a debate that really began with Trump in 2016 and moving into 2017. 
about what is the fundamental view of the right in state power and and what's the right's fundamental view of the role of state power. And what Sorab did was he he kind of Christianized that aspect of the debate. Um, that's one of the reasons why people found his point of view appealing was that it presented a different kind of Christian justification uh, for Donald Trump that people were very hungry for at that time. But I think it's all part of the same evolution uh, from a, a, a movement that was dispositionally suspicious of more of greater government government power to a movement that at least part of it is eagerly embracing it, embracing it to the point of wanting to undermine the very kinds of constitutional protections that the conservative legal movement yeah. has fought for for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and, and look, it's, it's, it's jumped the tracks outside of this sort of obscure, uh, melee at Catholic, at CUA, at Catholic university in, in September, 2019, when you have, you know, the JD Vance campaign, he is very much wanting to use government power. Josh Mm -hmm. Hawley very much wants to use government power as much and, and, and as much as he can. Ron DeSantis signing unconstitutional bills into law in Texas. You're seeing, uh, you know, these unconstitutional social media moderation bills advancing through the legislature. You're seeing uh, frontal attacks on private property that are uh, in private enterprise that are wanting to protect the health of their workers. All of this is vacuuming up more power to government. And their justification for it essentially is, well, it's the only thing we have left. Yeah. The left has the academy, the, the left mm-hmm. has the Hollywood, et cetera, et cetera. We've got government. And if we don't use government, we lose America. But my question is, if you're making America more authoritarian, aren't you losing America? Because <laughs> that's going against the fundamental nature of what our declaration stands for. I think this debate is going to go on long after Donald Trump is just a yeah. bad memory. This this is this is what the, the this is going to be a, a fight that is going to last long after uh, Trump. And in, in, in some ways, Trump is still at the center of it. And if he tries a restoration um, and the, the tactics he would apply, um, he could rely upon all of this. Um, you know, the, the, one of the scariest things, of course, about uh, a second Donald Trump term is uh, a Republican Party that has completely decided uh, that uh, they're OK with 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 anti-democratic behavior, anti um, unconstitutional behavior that 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 is frightening. But but even take him out, um, we're going to be having this debate for uh, yeah pro- probably the rest of our professional lives. I agree. I agree. I mean, I think that this is something that I you know if if you're going to say it used to, I've always said the Republican Party should not be I, equated with the conservative movement. Mm-hmm. Um, now you can't even s- equate conservatism with being on the right. Yeah, <laughs> there yeah. it's. They, they, I, and I, I'm consistently using terms like right wing and right. on the right as a yeah. distinguisher from conservative because they're growing increasingly separate in their I, worldviews. I, I, I think that that's a valuable distinction. I, I, I really do. David French, thank you so much for coming back on uh, the Bulwark podcast. Appreciate it very much. You can find David's work at The Dispatch. You also write for Time Magazine. Hey, you're all over the place, Tom. <laughs> well, thanks, Charlie. It's always such a pleasure to join you. I appreciate it so much. Well, thank you. And thank you all for listening to the Bulwark podcast today. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.